property manager that's going to give us a little hello again. Yes, <coughs> <coughs> job. School us on boards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just gave you a handout, and I apologize for the, the plot of it and the <coughs> way that it's laid out isn't the greatest. I was talking to one of my coworkers about talking to you guys about the services we did, and I said, oh, I have something. So literally 10 minutes before I ran out the door, I made these copies. Um, <laughs> But it does give a very good overview of what we do at Homeside for the association. So the board just kind of wanted uh, me to talk to you about how it kind of all works together. The board is elected. It's like a little mini political uh, society, uh, an association, because you all have elected the members within your association to work on your behalf. So they make the financial decisions. Um, obviously staying within their bounds, covenants, bylaws, um, or constitution <laughs> for that association. So um, what I do then is work on their behalf. So anything that they tell me to do uh, within uh, the rights of the association, I take that. So if I need to contact a landscaper or send you the email blast or um, any little thing at all, homeowner calls, when you know what your balance is, uh, bids, whatever the case may be, the board contacts me to take care of those issues on behalf of the association. Um, this is a rundown of what we do as a management company. There's a few things that are missing on here. I have uh, been in court several days this week for an association that's being sued by a member. So I have a deposition tomorrow morning. That's not on here, but should you guys ever be sued or we have to go to court to testify against a debt, if any of you have become delinquent and the association sues you for that debt, I'm the one who has to show up in court and go before the judge to say, yes, they owe the debt and the judge rules. So um, oftentimes if I'm out of the office, <coughs> I'm on property uh, doing walkthroughs or drive-throughs because we have a portfolio of communities. Not just this association, but 12 or 13 others. <laughs> so, so if I, if you ever call me and I'm not there, you can ask for my assistant, who is always in the office, or you can leave me a voicemail, or better yet, email, because I'm always answering my emails. I carry them around in my pocket. So um, do leave me a voicemail if it's something you want to talk to me about. Um, I will get back with you as soon as I'm back in the office. Um, so again, I may be on property, I may be in court, there's a lot of times where I'm just not at my desk, so I apologize if you ever try to reach me out there. But, going back to this, this is an overview, so we do all the financials for the associations, and I'm not going to sit here and read all of this to you, because um, you can see everything on here, but we do everything from uh, uh, sending out your coupons for your dues, collecting the dues, uh, maintaining each individual account, maintaining the bank accounts for the association, taxes, um, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of financial uh, aspects to what Homeside does. We have a whole department that does that. I review everything that they send or you know, send them if there's a write-off or something like that. I'm the one that sends that to accountants. So uh, we all work together as groups within our company to make sure things are handled. Um, on the back, there's collection and delinquency service, which again, uh, showing up for court appearances is not here, but we certainly do that as managers. Um, community standards and adherence. Some of you may have received letters because you may have a violation uh, that we see on your home. Um, you guys being newer, there's not a ton of things um, in the community. It looks pretty good right now. There's a few here and there. And there's a few that seem to be continuous, so that's something we're going to have to discuss at the next meeting about if, they, if the board wants to go ahead and start finding some of these individuals who are ignoring the letters. Um, there's a standard, uh, architectural standard in the community, and that's in your governing documents. You know, you can't use your back patio as a, a clothesline or uh, your, your curtains really should be a cream or white backing, so you know you don't have purple that's glaring out of the street. Um, things like that, courtesy to your neighbor. 
neighbors, obviously. Dogs barking on the patio all day and night. Those are violations in the community. And you guys kind of live close to one another, so it doesn't go unnoticed um, <laughs> when things are in violation. So just keep those things in mind. If you get a letter, it's not personal, it's business. <laughs> um, I get people very angry when they get letters sometimes. And then homeowner service. Um, I get several homeowner calls. The board isn't involved in those calls a lot of times. Um, you know, a homeowner may just have a question about the covenants or what they need to do if they need to install a satellite dish or what they need to do if they need a parking decal or um, trying to think for your community specifically. Um, what, what do I owe on my account? Um, you know, I was late this month. Can you waive my late for your interest? You know, that would be escalated to the board for approval. But there's a lot of little things that people call me about that I don't email the board about because they have better things to do. They have jobs during the day, and that's my job to be able to answer those without bothering. So um, this is just a little overview of what we do, and then you know what the board does for you. So the board is active every day. They're on email every single day um, for various things that come up in the community. It can be parking violations or just email blasts for this or that or just anything that comes up, um, <clears throat> gate bids and so forth. So it is a daily thing that your board does for you. And a lot of times the boards are unappreciated. So uh, just to let you know that is something that goes on daily. Um, and they're working on your behalf and you've elected them to do so. So um, does anybody have any questions about kind of the inner I don't question, but kind of a, I just to make sure, I'm sure what I think my mind is. I had someone ask me, they said, well, why do we have them? Can't we do that ourselves? And I said, my understanding is, not the state of Georgia, maybe the state of Atlanta, but the state of Georgia, or I guess Fulton County, requires that if you're more than two units or four units, you must have an, an outside company like yours the gold fund who handles things that manages all that stuff that you can't be self-managing. Um, that's not true. Um, you, it depends on what your documents state. And I don't know specifically in that section, but there's a section in your documents that states third-party management. And some of them will state you can, but you don't have to. Some of them state you have to. So it depends on what your documents state in that case. Um, that would be in the bylaws. Usually. Well, I had no desire. However, I will say, we, right. get, we get a lot of communities that have been self-managed. Um, you know, we have communities that we get that come in the door that used to have a management company, they decided to self-manage and come back, or they've never had professional management and they're self-managed and they're a mess. But um, I invite anyone who ever wants to come and sit with me for the day to do so. <laughs> and then if you want to decide to self-manage. More power to you. <laughs> I, I, you know, like you said, they were a mess. I, I lived in a community like that. That was so finished. So yeah. and, but everybody has a job yes. as well. And then trying to do those things like she just said, phone calls, answer all those questions, send out letters and everything that just doesn't work with people who have full-time jobs. Right. So then they decided they were going to pay someone, uh, an administrator, to do it. And they paid someone a salary of $12,000 a year. She did half the things that needed to be done. Still at twelve thousand, and she babysat that during the day. So if you can just imagine, you know, like what she's talking about, and how much we communicate with her, I don't see how anybody could be self-managed, especially at the size that we are. And that's just a even size. Well, the communication isn't even the biggest aspect of it. It's the financial yeah. side of yeah. things, yeah. and yeah. plus the uh, the responsibility of bank account management and homeowner individual homeowner account management. That's the larger picture. Uh, I would say, and why. Uh, that's what happens when people come in that are self-managed, their financial are just... <laughs> yeah. And also, too, your interface with the violators. You know what I mean? It comes from you, it doesn't come from another homeowner. Right. You know, so... Right. Unfortunately, you take the front of it, but... <laughs> that's, that's part of it. 12 years thick skin. <laughs> can, can you... Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the board's role when it comes to violations? Because we get a lot of 
homeowners, I think, that want us to go knock on people's door and tell them not to do yeah. stuff. Now, the board wants to live in their homes and be comfortable in their homes and um, not confront people. Not confront people on a daily basis. It's that's not the job of a, of a board member to go knock on the door saying, "Hey, you need to do this," or, or "Hey, you need to move your car." I mean, it's just privacy issues and and just neighborly uh, way to live. That's not something, they're not policing the neighborhood, okay? That's just what it comes down to a board. It's not there to police the neighborhood. I will get an email about it, and then we'll send a letter out formally, uh, or I make a phone call, or email the homeowner to try to resolve it that way so that it comes through me and not directly from, uh, from a board member. Um, but the board is, the board can go online at any time to see any violations that are ongoing in the community. Homeowners can also log into their individual accounts to see any open violations on their accounts. Um, and if they've been closed out or, or what have you, they can even, if a homeowner has a violation, they can log into their account and comment on that violation. And it comes to me as a comment. Um, so we can, you know, go back and forth that way. Um, but board members, again, they're not there to police the neighborhood. So um, please don't knock on their door to say so-and-so is doing something. If you feel comfortable talking to your neighbor, then, then great. If they're parking in your spot or, you know, their dog is barking all the time and you can hear it, that's really more of a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor thing. In that case, not a board to everything that you need situation. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just from your comments, I would gather that there's a sort of steps as, as in most protest type situations. If you feel comfortable addressing your neighbor on a one-to-one -one basis, sure. is obviously preferable. But if there, that does not work, then I gather we should contact you. Yeah, or if you're just not comfortable talking right. to your neighbor, you can contact me. A lot of neighbor, a lot of people will send me an email saying, people have their trash cans out and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Or people are parking in guest parking and they're not parking where they're supposed to. And that doesn't give me anything to work with. Or people aren't picking up after their dogs is probably the biggest thing that I get. I can't do anything with that if you don't have a name or an address to give me. So a lot of people don't want to tell on their neighbors and give me an address. Just don't tell me at all if you're not going to give me an address because I can't do anything with it. I really can't. And I'd love to help. But the more information you can give me, the better. If, you, if there's a specific car, what's the car, what's the tag number, you know, if you don't know where they're living. If you see somebody not picking up after their dog, and, you know, you can kind of inconspicuously walk along and see which unit they're going back into and take note of that and send me an email, just a quick little email saying so-and-so is not picking up after their dog, so we can address those individuals. I don't like sending out email blasts to the whole entire community, <laughs> blaming everybody for everything. Those are the worst kind of emails to me. It happens in the corporate environment all the time. Um, I would rather you just come straight to the source and say this is the problem <laughs> it needs to be fixed and not blame everybody in the community. So more information you have, the better. Fantastic. <laughs> Can you uh, talk a little bit about the HomeSide website and what's on there that the homeowners have access to? The homeowners have access to their accounts, to any violations that are on their accounts, uh, the monthly snapshot of financials for the association, um, and also you can enter a work order. Uh, board members have a little bit more than that. Um, they can see the full financials, including every single invoice that's been paid and so forth. But you guys can see the monthly financials um, all the time. It's, it's open for everyone. And there's also, you put board minutes out there? Yes, board yeah. minutes. That's right. Thank you. All the uh, the, documents. Yes, the land, documents. landscaping plans. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. yeah, anything that's public, the board makes right. public homeowners can go on their view. So there's a lot of good information and it gets updated constantly. Um, the rules and regulations, the community handbook, um, all of that is out there for you to look and at. your individual accounts. Uh -huh. monthly payments. Yep, your individual accounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go under documents on the left, and then the first thing that pops up is going to be the architectural control because it's in alphabetical order. So <laughs> you have to do the drop down and find all the rest of the different um, categories. And under each category, there's actually a list of a whole bunch. I always forget to go on that website, but I have a password, I always forget. 
I try to redirect people back to it. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, if somebody asks me a question, I'll answer it and I'll say, this is also on the website or, or you can check this on the website, kind of, you know, in a redirect but still answering them <laughs> at the same time. Can you speak to what executive session means and what it doesn't mean? Yes. Executive session. When the board has executive session. Right. Um, in a board meeting, which are open board meetings, and everyone is welcome to attend, you have an open session. And the open session is where the board talks about bids or anything going on specific to the community that affects everyone in the community. An executive session is usually at the end of a board meeting when it's closed. And if you come to a board meeting, you will be asked to leave at that point because we are going to talk specifically about accounts and individual homeowner accounts, which isn't everyone's business what's going on with individual accounts. So that is an executive session where the board may talk about going forward with a suit or you know, sending an account to the attorney uh, and those sorts of things. So if it's specific to an individual that's a private matter, that's an executive session. That's just for the board. Yeah, so it's not going to be published in your meeting notes. It may just say board, you know, executive session board discussed, you know, accounts that need to go to collections or whatever, but there's not going to be specific. So if there's a delinquent account mm -hmm. and the, the board was dealing with that, and, and the person caught up and, and there was a plan set for it, they caught up, everything's fine now. Mm -hmm. It, it saved that person face publicly. Mm -hmm. It keeps neighbors from Absolutely. saying, oh, that person's not paying. Her. Absolutely. You know, or that person's always late. I mean, it's not, it keeps that out of it so we can be neighbors and enjoy each other's company. Absolutely. And on the property without pointing our fingers at Yes, I had a board once. It was a large community. They had quite a few delinquencies, and the board felt the need to publish those delinquencies at the mailbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with names and addresses and amounts, oh, which oh, quickly had to be removed because you can legally do that, but you better be sure every single thing about it is right to the penny. Because if that homeowner paid that day, then you could be sued. <laughs> so, so you can do it, but you better know exactly what it is because it can change any moment. Uh, so yeah, that was one of those things. It happens. It helps us as, as current board members and board members to be better managers and overseers and still protect the integrity of the community relationships and enjoy, you know, having you know, peace and harmony and enjoying our homes. Sure. Instead of, you know, people talking about stuff they don't really need to be talking right, about. Right, you guys are at a very nice gossipy size here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, your townhomes, you're kind of in a little section there, so it's, you know, word probably gets around and it's like playing the game in a circle where you start something and by the time it ends up, it's nothing like really what happened <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> so, yeah. when you talk about when the board, what decisions they make and what decisions they actually should bring back to the community to have their input. Okay, a board, when you've elected the board, um, essentially you have elected them to do anything that's in your governing documents that allows them to do. So budgetary items, that's not necessarily something that they have to seek outside discussion about. I understand that. Um, mm -hmm. this, this Meaning they're within the budget? Budgetary items, meaning it's yeah, been well, budgeted I mean, for? Yeah, well, I mean, forming the budget itself. Okay. Even forming the budget. I understand that you guys are, are going to form a um, kind of a budget committee to, to bring some input in. But it's not something that boards have to do, and most boards don't do that. Um, but then once the budget is set, the board approves that budget, and um, it's, it's homeowners don't approve that. It's not a, you know, it's not an overall approval. Uh, and then as long as they operate within that approved budget, they don't really have to ask for input um, by members of the association. I think that it's a courtesy uh, to offer uh, certain things and certain things I'm like, hey, you know, you're going to have 73 different opinions on that. So it may not be in the best interest for the community as a whole to get all opinions. But it's up to the board, but it comes down to it really is up to the board how much 
input you guys feel you need or or want to have. So, but one question though I mean, is that you would have to have uh, with the community to approve the association fees that they would increase, right? That would support no. the budget. No, it states in your covenants that the board can make the dues anything that they need to make them to cover the budgetary needs for the association. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Some covenants will state they can't increase it more than 5% without a vote or something mm -hmm. like that, but this association. Uh, but if it's an assessment, it's I think an assessment. Assessments. It's an assessment. Even the assessments. Over a certain dollar. So assessments over a certain dollar. So I think our dollar limit is we could do an assessment up to like fifteen hundred dollars. Right. Without without approval. Which is we sure. as a board, I don't think any of our members would even do that. We would still come to the community. Right. Just to let you know it's happening. In most documents in that case, like a special assessment would be a two hundred dollar, but if it states specifically then they can assess up to that amount. But it, it will but state as far as the, regular, the budget, you can't just raise a regular association assessment. fees. Yeah, so, okay. so they can. They can. Oh, yeah, we can raise the fees. But the way our covenants. Kind of like input from the correct, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. But the, the way our is, covenants are written, it's a negative, it's written in a negative. And if I remember correctly, the board can, the board, the budget is approved mm -hmm. and presented to the community. Um, unless the community votes it down. Correct. So okay. the percentage has to vote it down. So a percentage so has to vote it down. The majority has to vote it down. Okay. But okay. otherwise it is okay. the budget and approved. Right. Right. But we and don't of course, take, you'd have to present a motion. Not a vote motion. to approve, but you can vote it down. You have to take a motion okay. to vote it down. It's not presented, it's presented as an approved budget. So. Okay. And voting it down is a percentage Usually, whatever it states in there, usually two thirds or more than fifteen percent. I don't know specifically what you're saying. Of owners, not those. Now that, that the meeting quorum is completely different than other quorums. There's other things like if you're um, if you're amending your covenants or your bylaws, that's like a two thirds yeah. yes or, or you know the vote. Yeah, same thing with voting down the budget. It wouldn't be just the majority at that meeting. Majority of the members of the members that are allowed to vote. Right. <laughs> if you owe, owe money to the association, you're not allowed to vote. So basically, this meeting would not have a majority. <clears throat> no. <laughs> this meeting would not have a majority. No. You could not vote down the budget. Correct. Okay. You would probably have a quorum for an annual meeting, though. <laughs> Did I answer your question, Jody, kind of about, I know, it's, yeah. it's kind of, um, it's not a set thing. It can't really say, okay, the board comes to the association for this or that. It's really, but as Ralph was kind of explaining, um, we have things that we need to do on an operating basis. They just come and go. There are normal bills. We've got the management company. We've got water. We've got electricity. And then we have maintenance is really the majority of the rest yes. of our budget. Um, Will we spend 100% of our budget that we have for landscaping this year? I don't know. But we know we have landscaping. We know we do have a fixed cost of a monthly fee. Then it's a matter of you still want to build into that. You're always going to have something that you're going to be doing for the landscaping. And so you want to put some money in there. What that represents, I don't know. It depends on what the what the board decides, what what maybe comes out from a community town hall meeting, you right. know. There's, like she said, so you have to have some wiggle room within the budget. You just can't say, okay, well, all we're going to pay for is the monthly right. landscaping and we're done. Right. There are set, I would say that, you know, probably 80% of the budget are set cost. Yeah. They're, they're, they're absolute costs based on contracts or, or need for the association. Mm -hmm. And then you have the 20% that you can go above and beyond. How much do you want to put into landscaping? How much do you want to put into signage? How much do you want to put into things that are greater than your actual need in your budget? Right. Reserve is more, it, it really, reserve really should be a set, this is what has to happen for future need. 
And like Ralph was saying, you guys are kind of short on your future need amount right now, which is why the, that budget, why you need to increase your assessments to increase the budget just simply for future need of that reserve. In, in your budget, you'll notice that uh, at the bottom, there's a reserve, uh, transfer to reserve line item, and then on your balance sheet, you have your checking account balance and then your reserve account balance, two separate accounts. So that line item that says transfer to reserve is everything that's left over, <laughs> basically at the end of the month, and you hope that what you budgeted for is left over at the end to be transferred into reserve. I was always told 10%. Ten, well, for FHA loans, 10% um, of your annual budget is what they like to see. Um, but you can't, that's for FHA loan. That's not for what you need for your community because every single community is different. Um, you know, older communities that, you know, large older communities, they're going to have to put more into their reserves than a smaller community such as this one for, for future. It just depends on the property completely. Age, type of construction. And well, 20 years, I've been 20 years old. So. <laughs> exactly. And you're, yeah, and you're going to be putting and it in might be the reserve is a bigger nut than the regular maintenance. <clears throat> exactly. And then it'll be painful when you have to get all your roofs and see the reserve on the balconies. Also, there are some things that I think the board has to do that maybe we didn't anticipate. Like we had uh, the builder put in these valves outside the mm -hmm. building that were not very good. And while things were being done, if within 15 minutes it blew out a hole and washed out in their driveway, mm -hmm. and it had been 15 more minutes, it had been the foundation of right. the unit. So, if, you know, and this person couldn't park or access their home via their garage right. for uh, it was a few weeks, but we were trying to get right. bids, it right trying to make things happen. It was <laughs> really not a good not time. Not warm enough. <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's, you know, we, we, did, we did get bids, but you know, did we get five bids and make sure we, right. you know, we didn't get five. Right, and that's uh, going to happen too. You know, you have to act sometimes in the best interest of the owner uh, who's uh, And hopefully, we'll, hopefully we won't have any of those. We're trying to avoid Right, them. and with this really cold weather, I just, I, Winter, I'm just like, please don't let me get a call at 3 a.m. or a hot spursing. <laughs> so, you know, newer construction's a little bit better, but you do have some of that too. Um, <coughs> you know, when you when your community gets to be <coughs> seven, eight years old, you're gonna start having you're gonna see your water bills starting to go up. And that's because you're gonna have more leaky toilets, you're gonna have more um, people with hot water heater leaks that aren't aware of it and things like that. So you're going to have to become very, very aware of money that's going down the drain. Literally, you'll start seeing that spike up. Not just with the water rates going up, but just in general. So, <coughs> yeah. Well, that's just standard home. That's, I mean, a lot of that's just standard homeowner. If anybody's ever owned their own home, a lot of this is standard homeowner. But if you don't get, logic, you know, yeah, yeah. But a lot of times it's just kind of like you don't see the actual big yeah. bill of what you're contributing to the association and how much it is. So, kind of outside of mind. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Everybody here know how to contact me if they need to. Okay.